Um, I'm your moderator, Donna Folk. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, Judith Berman. Judith Berman works for the Anthropology University of Pennsylvania, and she earned a BA in Russian and comparative literature and anthropology in, at Bennington College, Vermont. Mrs. Berman's research for her dissertation was on oral literature, myths, and religion of the Kwaka Kwaka Indians of British Columbia. Dr. Berman's recently served as assistant curator for the ex exhibition Promo Basket Weavers. They, um, their baskets and their art market, and continues research on various aspects of Central and Northern Northwest Coast peoples, including long-term research on the Lewis Shot Ridge Collection at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She's also an acclaimed novelist, so let's introduce uh, Judith Berman. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's slightly out of date um, in that I'm in the teaching the folklore department at Penn. And um, I'm not, I still have a connection with the museum, but it's not my uh, full time employment. Um, I would like to first extend my gratitude to Steve Hendrickson and all the people who have worked so hard to organize this conference and for making it possible. not make it possible for me to actually handle technology, for making it possible for me to physically be here. It's um, quite a trek from Philadelphia, and I don't get out here nearly as often as I would like. Um, so this has really been a, a tremendous experience for me to be able to interact with all these people who normally I'm um, dependent on emailing. And especially, you know, in the last few years, a lot of my research has taken place in solitude in archives on the East Coast, and um, that makes it particularly nice to be here and to see the culture alive. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really just going to be a progress report on ongoing research into the first hundred years of contact in southeast Alaska, in which I'm attempting to combine Tlingit genealogies, oral histories, and early written records. I initially, it's the left, yeah, there he is, um, initially came to this project through my work with the manuscripts of George Hunt who was born in 1854 and lived to um, 1933. Hunt was the son of a Hudson's Bay Company employee and a Tantaquan Tlingit woman, but he lived most of his life at Fort Rupert on Vancouver Island. During the last 45 years of his long life, he was paid by anthropologist Franz Boas to record a huge variety of materials in the Kwakwala language, some of which deal with historical topics or recount his own early life experience, which include trips to Alaska. About 12 years ago, I began working on a biographical article on Hunt, um, which is a whole long story. The article, the volume it was written for has never been published, but I hope to publish the article somewhere. And went searching for information on his Tlingit background to supplement the intriguing fragments in his papers. This search led me to the published literature on the, on the fur trade, as well as to the archives. I had formed the impression from ethnographic sources that until around 1870, whites had been rather scarce on the coast outside of the scattered HBC posts and centers like Sitka and Victoria. What was rapidly impressed upon me was that anthropologists in many colonial institutions did not appear on the coast until well after a hundred years of rather intensive contact. This was particularly true of the native groups closest to Dixon entrance, where by 1780, the maritime fur trade was already in full swing. There's a very impressive description in um, Captain Bishop's journal where it talks about sailing up um, past the Queen Charlotte's and they come in towards shore and there's this Haida fort on this promontory which has cannons aimed at them. <laughs> and um, these big, big brass cannons and they said, well, okay, we're not gonna stop here. But that's 1792. Um, here's a not a typical couple of weeks in Kaigani in 1801 from the log of the Pali. May 27th, at 12 Meridian, came to anchor at Tadeski, which I think is Datsku Harbor near Kaigani. May 31st, arrived in this harbor, ship Enterprise, Captain Ezekiel Hubble from New York, ship Lucy, Captain Pierpoint, Boston. June 1st, arrived in this harbor, Brig Latiller, Captain John Dorr from Boston, Brig Lavinia, Captain Sam Holbrook from Bristol, ship Atahualpa, Captain Wilds from Boston. June 2nd, Arrived ship dispatch, Camu Captain Samuel Adams Dorr from Boston. June 3rd, arrived ship Hazard, Captain Swift of Boston. June 6th, Brig Lavinia went out of the harbor. 
June 7th, the Enterprise, Lucy, Latiller, Atahualpa, and Dispatch got underway and run out of the harbor. June 9th, arrived Brig Lavinia. So the Brig Lavinia has come right back. June 17th, arrived ship Bell Savage, Captain David Ockington from Boston. So you can see that the anchorages where the ships could actually um, stay were extremely busy. And they're there because they're doing trade the whole time that they're there. I began to realize that the records of the maritime fur trade were a large and largely untapped source of information on native peoples from this early period. I say untapped because the historians who have worked with it have not pursued the history of native communities. And I say large, but I'm still just learning how big it really is. The surviving English language ship logs number several dozen, um, maybe more than 50, and are scattered in archives across the US, Canada, and Great Britain. The contents of these vary widely from simple daily notations of weather and position to discursive journals and show a corresponding variety of attitudes toward an, toward an interest in Native people that they were trading with. HBC records begin a few decades later. 1831 was the establishment of Fort Simpson and include correspondence, maps, employee payroll records, daily trading journals, and Fort Simpson was frequented by Tlingit and Haida, as well as Niska, Tsimshan, and other more southerly groups. And also trading journals kept by a series of steamships, which had a regular route, which took them all the way up to Klakwan, so all the way through southeast Alaska. I only discovered this quite recently. Um, and the Hudson's Bay Company records tend to be much more informed, tend to be they tend to be quite informative about native communities, in part because the people who were keeping them were married in. So, and also because they were permanent residents. So typical entries might be Unda or Ebbets arrived today, Unda being the head of the Te Kwe Di at that time, from the Tantaquan. But you also find entries like, Unda came today to make up an old quarrel with the Kitland chief. They had a rice feast. And I said English language, but then there are also French and Russian sources. So it is, it sometimes seems like an ever expanding body of material. Another of the places my search for George Hunt's Tlingit roots took me was to the field notes of Ronald Olson, an anthropologist who re had recorded a fair amount of Tantaquan oral history in 1933 and 1934. Now, if there's anybody who's come in late, there's some handouts up at the front. Olson's papers contain four genealogical charts obtained from Cora or Clara Benson, Dane Kulat of the Klokwan Ganach Dedi, Mrs. Dan Cameron, Yandus Gate, Asitka Kiks Adi, Charlie Jones of Wrangell, who was Sheikhs the Seventh, and uh, Cora Benson, um, who was uh, Jenny Klanouts, one of her, the teachers of. Um, Jenny Clonout for Chilkat Weaving. And um, George McKay, Skawuye, at Tantaquan Ganachedi. Ganachedi. McKay was a cousin of George Hunt's, who was about 10 years younger. These four genealogies vary considerably in time depth, time depth and collateral spread. They're all interesting, but the Benson and McKay charts are extraordinary. Cora Benson's reaches an astounding 19 generations before her own, while McKay's genealogy ascends 11 generations above him to the Ganachadi ancestress June. Here's a piece of the McKay chart showing in rather tangled form the four or five generations preceding his own. It actually shows it begins three times, which it, it, it's very tangled up on the page. Um, you can see how Olson rec recorded the information onto pages torn out of field notebooks. Some of the genealogies show evidence that Olson discussed them afterward with his sources. McKay's does not. These charts are a rich store of knowledge. The fact that certain names on them show up both in early documentary sources and in Plinkett oral, oral histories recorded by Olson, John Swanton, Frederica de Laguna, Louis Shotridge, William Paul, among, and others caused me to wonder whether they might provide a key to connecting native and white forms of history. 
Sorting through the wealth of information in pursuit of this goal is not a simple task. Olson's charts show networks of people connected by blood and marriage, but who are not organized by clan membership. That is, clan and house group affiliations are noted on the charts, but kin connections with even one's fellow house group members are as likely to be shown according to links through fathers across clan boundaries as through the maternal line. This was contrary to my initial expectation about how genealogical knowledge would be organized in a clan-based society, but in harmony with what others have said and which, you, um, which I have observed in the many of the proceedings that have been going on here um, about the importance in Tlingit culture of relationships on both sides. Now, one of the smaller handouts is this chart. I wasn't sure how um, easy it would be to read on the screen. This is one example of this reckoning through um, across clan boundaries. An important figure in McKay's chart is Seichtin, the so-called Bride of Tongas, whose story Louis Shotridge wrote about. Seichtin was the mother of two Tantakwan Ganachedi clan leaders of the early 19th century, Kathian and Santagao. Please excuse my Tlingit pronunciations. I understand them better than I can produce them. Um, McKay did not give Olson his connection to Seichtin through the line of matrilineal descent in Drifted Ashore House, which is the red on the screen, but rather via the children first of Eichtin's eldest son, Kashian, in the Tekwedi Valley House, and second of her youngest son, Santa Gao, through the Tongas Dakhloedi Killer Whale House, the Dakhloedi being blue and the green being um, Tekwedi. If you have the black and white charts, I do not mean to slight the Tekwedi, it's just that the green did not um, show up in the black and white um, copying, which is why it looks so faint. McKay certainly possessed genealogical knowledge that doesn't show up in Olson's chart, but which does appear in the historical narratives Olson recorded. He may well have known how his maternal line linked up to Eichtin, but it's as if these were the links uppermost in his mind, and he or Olson never got around to pursuing information that lay deeper in his memory. Combining Olson's genealogies with other native forms of history has helped broaden the picture. One of these forms is a succession list of house masters or clan leaders. There are quite a few more succession lists and genealogies available that refer to the period before 1870, but they provide little if any information about how the men in them were related to each other outside of common membership in their house group. Here, continuity of the position is the focus rather than the exact genealogical connection. One such list is Cora Benson's series of leaders who, from the time of its founding, rebuilt the Klukwan Raven House. Kakai Gus Gunanesti Gunachat, which is a spelling I'm not sure about. Yes Guhu Kindach Gush and Yechak. Yechak's nephew, according to various histories, is the man who founded the whale house in Klukwan. A third form of history is that found in narrative. Historical narratives recorded from George McKay and others of his time consistently refer to house and clan leaders of the era that I'm interested in. Interested in. Some contain an embedded succession list. For example, the authentic history of Shakes Island and clan, which Charlie Jones related to Edward Keithon. While narratives often contain more information than the unadorned list regarding genealogical relations between a clan leader and a successor, the information is rarely complete. Now, clan leaders are the individuals with whom early visitors most frequently interacted and who are therefore most frequently written about in the records that they kept. Understanding the relationship between genealogy and succession would bring a third kind of information to bear that it would enrich the understanding of both recorded oral histories and documentary sources. I was very fortunate to be able to discuss the McKay chart with Emma Williams and Esther Shea of the Tantaquan Tequidi while they were still alive, as well as with Mary Jones, who, um, of the Sanyakwan, who had hoped to be here today, but I'm very sorry, was unable to attend. Um, each of these women had parents 
grandparents and or aunts or uncles on the chart and generously shared their knowledge. Mary Jones also very generously shared her own family history files and family genealogical charts with me. These elders were able to clarify relationships, correct the spelling of many Tlingit names, and supply the English names, which Olson had systematically omitted for the most recent generations. I would also like to thank the Tongass tribe and Dan Monteith for making available their collection of publications referring to Tongass, which also helped to give me a better sense of the McKay materials. None of these knowledgeable people should be held responsible for the mistakes I might have made, which I'm sure exists. Despite this considerable aid to understanding, many questions remain regarding the earlier portions of the McKay chart. Some of the puzzles arise because Olson made errors when committing the information to paper, and because he apparently did not review it with McKay. Another complicating aspect, characteristic of all the genealogical and oral historical material is the tendency of names to repeat in successive generations of a lineage. The ground shark house of the Nanyai is perhaps the most extreme example of this, where something like six men, depending on who's counting, used the name Sheikhs over the course of the 19th century. Since my initial focus was Tantaquan history, I did not initially intend to work on Olson's other three charts, and I haven't yet had the opportunity to discuss them with descendants. But the Benson chart is extensively supplemented by Lewis Shotridge's surviving genealogical files, and together they reveal exactly the kind of combined succession list and genealogical network I would like to be able to create with George Hunt's and George McKay's forebears. Moreover, De Laguna, Emmons, and Shotridge have already done some of the work with historical sources that I hope to complete further south. And the, the first large sheet, I, it should be first in the order that you got, but it's labeled number one, um, is the Benson and Shotridge materials. And it's a piece, well it's actually just a piece of them drawn to include only people, um, and there are many siblings and other marriages that I left out, but only people in those three lineages and who lived approximately between 1700 and 1870, with the excep exception of Louis Shotridge himself, who was born approximately 1880, 1882. I mean, there, there's nobody who was born after eight, 1870 who was on it. The figure shows marriages between leading lineages of the Klekwan Ganach Dedi, the Klekwan Kaguan Tan, and the Stiki Nanyai from about 1750 to about 1880. The house front shape indicates which of the men held the position of clan leader, and the dates refer to mentions of the individual in historical documents. I don't have time to do more than mention a few points about the chart. Um, if I could be, still be talking on Tuesday, if um, I went into all of the interesting things. But first, I want to mention that or point out the degree of consistency in lineage alliances, which is echoed but not completely matched in McKay's chart, where you have generation after generation of marriage between um, the Ganach Dedi and the Nanyai on one side and the Ganach Dedi and the Kaguantan on the other. Second, the large sheet um, demonstrates that although genealogical position within the lineage is generally omitted from these early succession lists, it does seem to have affected who ended up filling the role of clan leader. And here you see father-son relationships between the clan leaders. And so the, the arrow says father of, so Kshu is father of Vielchak, and so on. And here is a, another way of um, looking at the family relationships the degree to which clan leaders married the daughters of other clan leaders. Lastly, to stray a bit from the topic, some of the men and women on the chart who can now be linked directly or indirectly to calendar dates are also linked in oral histories with the origins of important crest objects. For instance, I'm not going to say this right at all, otherwise known as um, I need somebody else to be saying these names, is mentioned by both Shotridge and Emmons as the first Klukwan woman, or one of the first, to learn the techniques of what came to be known as Chilkat weaving, after studying an important, uh, imported Tsimshan robe. Kaluatla was the sister of Yelchak number one. Um, 
Well, you, you, I don't want to try to go back. I'll just mess it up. But it's, he's on your charts. Who was almost certainly the Chilkat Toyon, quote unquote, who Russian sources tell us died between 1788 and 1794. So her lifespan would have overlapped to a considerable degree with his. Now, as I mentioned, and this is um, the second large sheet, shows the McKay, um, some of the, a piece of the McKay, the McKay genealogy, again, sh with anybody who was born after about 1870 excluded, and a lot of the collateral um, relatives not drawn. The genealogical relationships are more uncertain in the McKay materials, and the documentary record is therefore more difficult to interpret in relation to it. Um, but I will briefly sketch some of the findings so far about historical sources and oral history. So far, the earliest documentary mention of a Tantaquan site I've come across is the harbor of quote unquote Cochlins in 1801. By that time, the site was already well known to visiting ships and easily located by them and frequently visited. Cochlins has been misidentified by historians as Petersburg but from navigational and other details in ship logs, it is clearly Tungus Harbor on Annette Island. A second Tantaquan site frequently mentioned is so-called Clemel or Clemon City, which was well known to ships by the 1820s, if not before. The site was named after the Clemels, jargon for the Elkhides, much prized for armor in the early days of the fur trade. Clemel City is Kadukuka on Tongas Island. Now, I don't know how easily you can see the details of it, but um, according to history recorded by Olson and William Paul, the Tantaquan were using both Tumgus Harbor and Clemel City as regular seasonal campsites before the arrival of fur traders. The traders, in fact, noted native people leaving Tumgus, Har Tumgus Harbor for Clemel City in February and March to fish and leaving again by December for their winter village, quote unquote. I have not yet come across a mention of coasting ships visiting the Tantaquan winter village of that area, Egan, despite the disappointment expressed when trade disappeared in winter along with the Tantaquan. In 1810, Samuel Hill, captain of the Otter, remarked that most ships did not know where native winter villages were located. This seems unlikely to have been true for the Rob Roy, a brig that in the 1820s spent months at a time in Tumgus Harbor interacting with the Tantaquan. But it seems that it is true for us today with regard to Kagan. I came here expecting that, that I would be able to solve this question by talking to archaeologists who are familiar with the region. And it seems as though Kagan is the lost village. It, it um, must be the only village site inhabited in the 19th century, which has, has, nobody knows where it is now. Um, George McKay, who I think, you know, he, was, he overlapped with people who had grown up at Kagan. And, he says it was on Duke Island, and I think I, my instinct is to believe him, but no village site has been located yet on Duke Island that um, would correspond with something as um, intensively used as a winter village site. But as far as the ships not visiting it, one point made very clear in the ship logs is the degree to which the movements of the large sailing vessels were dependent on the quality of anchorage. Perhaps the favorite anchorage in southeast Alaska was so-called Tadiski, um, which I th again I think is Datsku Harbor, north of Kaigani. The physical limitations of sailing technology may be the cause of the fact that, according to William Bryant, the residents of Kaigani did not hunt the furs they offered for sale. If true, they must have assumed the role of middlemen for communities not as well situated for the trade. The reasons why um, native people might choose a winter village site were different from those that um, the sailing vessels would have needed. Tumbus Harbor was not quite as popular as Kaigani, but in severe weather, the ships often sh sought shelter there. Bryant of the Rob Roy rated it as one of the finest harbors in the world, despite being, as he wrote, the most stormy harbor on the coast. Its bottom was excellent holding ground where anchors rarely pulled loose. Other writers of the era noted the harbor's reputation as the best in this part of the coast went to obtain spars and other word wood for ship repair. The Tantaquan also specialized as provisioners for Russian ships, visiting whalers and Boston traders alike who stopped at Tumgus to buy the deer, ducks, geese, and swans offered for sale along with the furs. 
With the establishment of nearby Fort Simpson in 1831, they became the principal provisioners for the HBC post as well. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of the oral history that I wanted, but um, the ship logs indicate that the Cochlands is actually the lower harbor, and Lewis Shotridge actually <coughs> indicates that the site was right at the outlet of Tumbus Lake. And only in the 1830s did the Tantaquan begin to build houses on the island, winter houses. I mean, there was quite a, a settlement of, of houses that they didn't uh, live in the around there, according to the descriptions of the ship lots. But um, they built their winter, winter village in Port Chester in the 1830s. The earliest reference to a living clan leader at Cochlands to emerge so far is Kudena whom traders named as the head chief in, eight, in 1810. Let me skip over things very rapidly. The most visible Tantaquan personage in the fur trade between 1819 and 1836 was the Tequiti leader, Negut. Was, there's a lot of oral history about him. Um, Negut's location in McKay's genealogy is another of its uncertainties. Um, the, the dates on the chart show dates of various historical mentions of these characters. Um, from Bryant, we learned that Negut rebuilt his house, the Tequiti Valley house at Kegan, presumably, and held the housewarming in the winter of 1823, at which Stikin and Kassan guests were invited. Um, so in the 1830s, they started building houses at Port Chester. By um, 1836, the smallpox epidemic reduced it by nearly one third. Bancroft says it had about 900 residents before that. Um, and I talk about some questions of um, demography. Um, the Tantaquan chart shows that relative to the Klekwan, um materials, the Ganache, the, the Tantaquan were had a much higher rate of outmarriage, marrying with Icy Strait, Kaguan Tan, Stiki, Nanyai, Niska, Haida, Tsimshan, and probably other neighboring groups. Outmarriage may have been a deliberate policy in pursuit of trade and other opportunities in the way that the Benson materials suggest careful attention in the North to the long-term stability of a smaller number of alliances. And um, the HBC, oh, that's the um, succession in Tantaquan Valley and drifted ashore houses where you can see the similar kinds of relationships, but it's not as consistent. You have that in your other small handout. And that's one of the Tantaquan women who um, married Hudson's Bay Company men, Mary Hunt, Mary Ebbets Hunt, Anain, An Silaga is the name that Kwakwala give her. Um, so the community at um, Port Chester was destroyed in the 1840s, and the Tantaquan moved to Village and Cat Islands, um, where they lived for not long, but had a very substantial um, community. William Paul says they had 15 houses on Village Island and seven on Cat Island. And um, the Daklawedi and Tequedi began moving in the 50s. I, I, I think it must have been once the peace had been made and they were no longer um, seeking such a, a good defensive spot back to um, Clemel City, which had been a seasonal occupational site before that, and now they built permanent houses there. And this is the earliest, one of the earliest photographs from Southeast Alaska, 1867. Um, I'm sorry, that should be 1868. And it shows Tequidi men at Tongas Island, and I think probably Ganachadi women on the right. You see this man in the back who has a Tilkat robe and a frontlet, a bear frontlet. I believe that's Amba, who was head of the Tequidi at the time. And this woman in the hat, I don't know, but I speculate that she is his wife, Ansit, um, who was the mother of Mary Hunt. And this pole here is the uh, sea bear pole, I believe, with the woman <coughs> who um, he took down into the ocean. And this is a, a valley house, special valley house crest. And just the last photo, this is Kaduguka on Tongas Island in the 1880s. And here's Raven House. You can't see this in the photo, but these um, boards have <coughs> names of Ganachedi leaders on them. And this one says Kianuk, who was the leader at the time. 
And here is the Valley House Pole. The Valley House has moved somewhere else in the village. And here is the so-called Lincoln Pole, the Proud Raven Pole, standing in front of it. So this is a real, it's a very interesting project, and it's um, a lot of time-consuming research with sometimes a little payoff and sometimes really great payoff. But thank you for listening. Next up is uh, Diane Purvis, and Diane is from the Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. Uh, I kind of lost on copying my notes about Diane, but I hope she'll introduce herself. Okay, I'll introduce myself briefly. My name is Diane Purvis. I'm a professor of history and cultural studies at Alaska Pacific University. And uh, the field I'm going to cover today is a comparison between Linket traditional law and the Oregon Deddy Code, which I will explain in a moment. I'm very happy to be back in Sitka again. It's been 10 years since I've been in Sitka, and this place is so full of history. It's just wonderful to be here again. I've had the opportunity to listen to many people, young people, elders here, when we were here with a the theme of sharing our knowledge. Um, as far as sharing our knowledge, I don't think I've actually paid my dues to call what I, what I say knowledge. I'm going to provide for you a piece of verified history today. The topic of my paper concerns traditional Tlingit law and how it contrasted with the Oregon Code that was in force in Alaska until the Organic Act of 1884. The Organic Act finally established local governments, which had been lacking in Alaska since the time when the explorers first got here. There is also an important connection to the 1834 Trade and Intercourse Act. The Trade Act had implications for the definition of Indian country. An Indian country and its definition is extremely important. It meant that <clears throat> American laws applied. Now, why the importance of Matthew Deddy, Judge Matthew Deddy? It was his court in Oregon that had jurisdiction over Alaska until the 1884 Organic Act. He had jurisdiction over Oregon, Washington Territory, and Alaska Territory. And how he defined laws had a significant effect on Southeast Alaska. <clears throat> the Lincoln Law and Deddy's Code were in conflict, to say the least, in their definition. In the end, this conflict would not only affect the Clinket, but the whole idea of sovereignty in Alaska. He would set the precedent with his decisions. Traditional law for the Lincoln, as well as the Simpson and the Haida, was based on equity. In 1879, Captain Lester Beardsley, who was part of the Navy, and he was here for 15 months, was the first one that looked at Clinkett Law and said, this is like Mosaic Law, in the eye for an eye fashion. But it was not an act of revenge, like some historians have labeled it. It was instead to restore the balance in society that was very important to restore the balance in society in a reciprocal way. There was a meeting out of, of justice that was codified in Lincoln Law. It was a matter of keeping the peace in every sense of the word. The first people of Southeast Alaska had a very stratified social system. Everyone in a clan had their own status in that clan. If a murder was committed, even if it was accidental, then someone must pay for that murder. It wasn't necessarily the person that committed the crime, 
but it was someone from the other clan who was of equal status to that person. And they must give up their life. And the oral narrative shows that there was a strict code of how this was done. The ritual slaying, the regalia that was worn, the funeral song that was sung. It was all codified in the Clinket Law. There is no simplistic way to talk about Clinket Law today. It's very complex. I'm writing a, a long level uh, article for Alaska History right now concerning that. And also I am writing a book about Clinket history that considers law and politics from 1741 to 2000. So it's very complex. Uh, nothing that we can cover in just 20 minutes. But I want to give you some highlights. Before the Organic Act in Alaska, there were no courts. There were no juries. There were no judges. The only established law was that of the first people of Southeast Alaska. Between the years of 1879 and 1884, the court of Judge Matthew Deddy had a great effect on the legal decisions that happened in Alaska. Deddy's interpretation of the law, especially the Trade and Intercourse Act, had a large impact on what would happen to Clinkett people who were taken down to the Oregon court. Based on Judge Deddy's interpretation, through the 1834 Trade and Intercourse Act, there were many legal definitions of Alaska. But he did say, time and time again, Alaska was not Indian country. In his narrow view, it did not qualify as Indian country. In fact, Judge Deddy didn't believe there was Indian country anywhere west of the Rocky Mountains. And why was this? Because Congress did not spell out Washington Territory or Alaska Territory beyond the realities of what was actually happening here. The term Indian Country, once again, is significant because it allows for indigenous law to be in place. That means if there is a fence between a native and another native, that is decided by the community, by the village, by the clan according to the law that has been since time immemorial. But Judge Deddy said in his decisions, many times not even paying attention to other legislation that it went through, that Alaska was not Indian country and could not be protected as Indian country. In 1868, the stipulations of the Trade and Intercourse Act, sections 20 and 21, were put in place to regulate the trade of liquor into Alaska. This alone was the definition of Indian country. Stemming from several court cases during this period, it was deemed that the territory was not Indian country. And the first case was in 1873. This was United States versus Seveloff. There was a man whose name was Faruto Seveloff, who sold liquor to a Lincoln Sitka man in violation of Indian country. He went in front of Judge Deddy's court in Oregon, and Judge Deddy's decision was Alaska was not Indian country, so no violation had taken place. He was free and clear. Right there, you've set a precedent that's going to be carried on and on and on. Another case between two non-natives, U.S. versus Williams, where Williams had shot another non-native in a saloon in Sitka. He traveled down to the court, once again, of Judge Matthew Deddy. Judge Deddy said no crime had taken place because there was no statute that said that murder was a crime in Alaska. 
That defies common law and common sense. He went free. So the question begs, did Judge Deddy apply the law equitably? Whose justice was it? Another case, 1879, puts another twist on it. This is the case of U.S. versus Cotwat. He was sentenced to hang. His crime was the killing of a man, Tom Brown, at the Hot Springs, which was located about 60 miles outside of Sitka. The rationale for his deed was that there had been unrequited deaths for the five Clinkett killed on the San Diego, a ship, in 1878. You see, the, once again, if there is death to restore the balance, someone must pay for the crime, then balance is restored. This was not forthcoming. Cotahuat took the law into his own hands, yes. He went to trial in front of Judge Deddy, who said, you are sentenced for this murder, and you will hang. But according to Clinkett Law, what, what customs were broken? OK, the custom of a life for a life was not broken. His clan had no problem with that. But his body was dissected. And that meant that he could not go to the next world. That was a crime much larger than the initial crime. Not only that, because of Oregon's 1878 Act to Promote Medical Science, which allowed the dissection in the first place, he was not allowed to leave Oregon. Therefore, his clan did not have the proper funerary rights. Another blow at justice. In a similar case in 1882, United States versus Kitata, the circumstances of murder and that type of thing are almost exactly the same. However, here's the clincher. When the verdict was read, part of the clause was this being Indian country, referring to Sitka. Perhaps this just went right by Judge Matthew Deddy. The last case to describe today is U.S. versus Key. This was heard on appeal in Judge Deddy's court in 1868. On appeal because by then Sitka had its own courts that were part of the Organic Act of 1884. Key went before the newly formed court. Now you must understand that under Clinkett law, he had committed no crime because his wife had committed adulterous behavior, and the murder of his wife was justified under that code. But there was a clamor from the non-native population who said, this man must be tried. He was tried and given 10 years by the Sitka court, but his attorney objected, because in his legal opinion, Sitka was Indian country. And offenses between natives are regulated by the native community, not Western law. He was sent to Oregon to face appellate juries, judge, and of course, the judge was still Matthew Deddy. Matthew Deddy once again <clears throat> said this is not Indian country. And so sentenced him to seven years in Sitka. There is no record that he ever served that time. The historical record also further shows that the Army and later the Navy treated Sitka and the outlying areas as if it was Indian country. This was the easiest way to maintain peace. Commander Lester Beardsley was a man who was far-sighted. He could see the best way to keep law and order was to respect the Clinkett Law. Commander Beardsley's documents record that this was the best way to maintain harmony between diverse groups. It is apparent that Judge Deddy's 
code severely undermined Tlingit sovereignty. And yet, he did not let the American system apply equally, leaving Sitka lawless. This would have ramifications later because it set the foundation, the precedent, for dispossession of land and waterways. According to Judge Deddy, Alaska was not Indian country, although the historical record indicates <clears throat> that certain tenants had extended to Alaska. The land in southeast Alaska was never ceded. It was never given up. The Clinton were never conquered. Unlike the lower 48, there were no treaties to define legal ownership, and there were no reservations set aside to protect land interest. The conditions up here in Alaska were very different than the lower 48. The decisions of Judge Deddy contributed in part to the claim that Alaska was not Indian country and could not be protected as such. In the larger scope, one must ask, whose justice was it? Thank you. My name is Ben Paul. My Klingit name is Kunak Nasti. That means to be the most or to be more. I'm still trying to figure out more of what, but uh, I'm Raven Tiatan. My great grandmother was Tilly Paul. Uh, Tilly Paul Tamri with her second husband. Is Kathy O'Gara here? Hi, Kathy. I'm meeting a new relative here. <laughs> That's good. Uh, her, Tilly Paul's son was William Paul Sr. His, his son was William Paul Jr., my father. What I would like to do this morning is, <clears throat> does everybody have a handout here? This is a list, essentially a list of uh, information that the, the Paul family has written down and collected over three or four generations now. I would like to uh, go over that uh, point by point. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little story about how I came to be standing here before you today. This photo here is William Paul, senior grandpa and grandma, Francis Paul. That's me in the middle, a strapping 18 year old in 1969. Basketball is the uh, greatest sport in the world. And next time we schedule it, this conference maybe a week later would be better because the NCAA tournament is on. Okay, that. <clears throat> uh, a week later is gold medal. <laughs> two weeks, two weeks later. The weather will be better. <laughs> uh, this was in our living room in North Seattle in 1969. What happened about two minutes after this photograph, I was standing in front of my grandmother and I'm saying goodbye, I was going to take off in my Chevy and um, William Paul, Grandpa said, you may kiss your grandmother's ring. And this wasn't any part of family tradition. Nobody else was kissing Grandma's ring that day. I said, do you want me to kiss her ring? And he said, go ahead, kiss, kiss grandma's wedding ring. This was, her, this was their 50th wedding anniversary. That was the reason for the gathering. So I took her hand and I, I kissed her ring. And that was it. Uh, about a year later, grandma died. That was 1970. My own father died a little young in 74. William Paul died in 77. <clears throat> All the way till 1995. Somebody got it in their head in our family that the uh, my generation of of Pauls should have Klingit names. So we got together a uh, big party. Looking back, we could have done a better job in a naming ceremony, but we did all right. We had a couple of dance groups. We had a, a big banquet, rented a hall, gifts were given, uh, names were given. 
And when I received my Klingit name, things began to wake up in me. One of the things that uh, was required of people receiving names that day was to make a simple headband with a drawing of some kind of form line drawing on it that, uh, so we could make a, con a further connection between a culture and an individual. So we all got out grandma's uh, drawings. Grandma was, was a very, very good artist. And to get ideas, you know, uh, what to put on the headband. And as we were drawing them, we were finishing up and my cousin Mike looks over my shoulder and he says, there it is. That's where grandma's talent went, right there. And I thought, oh, come on, everybody can do this, can't they? And I looked at his and I said, oh, you know, I guess everybody can't do it. I don't consider myself a great artist, but uh, I can make a couple of straight lines. And that was when I began to dive into my father's photography and all the wealth of information that the Paul family has written down. And it's interesting that you're put, putting me on, you're putting the grandson of William Paul, the Indian lawyer, on after somebody who's just talked about uh, Indian law and white law. <laughs> it was interesting. So I wonder if somebody planned that. Well, uh, let's begin to go over the, um, the list here. Okay, the... Uh, <coughs> The William Paul Photography Collection has been on the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute website. Probably many of you have viewed it on there. Um, I've gotten dozens of emails from, from people. I've, I think I've answered everyone to help identifying the photographs. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. There is contact information there. If you want to use some of the photographs, I can, I'd be glad to, uh, to mail you uh, high quality digital reproductions or, or archival prints uh, at cost for family use or, uh, or for other uses too. Um, now we get into a book that was published two years ago, a little, le a little less, <clears throat> Then Fight For It. This is the book by Fred Paul, who was my uncle Fred Kudenake was his name. It's one of the chief shakes' old names. If you want to know about the greatest battle that the Klingit Haida natives of, and the natives of Alaska ever fought, this is the best book on it. It was written by a Klingit lawyer who got caught in the conflict of uh, being a Klingit and being loyal to his people, but he was a lawyer for the North Slope Eskimos. And of course the big conflict there was that the, the North Slope people wanted, wanted it all divided up according to land area, and the more, much more numerous Klingit and Haida wanted it divided up according to population. I think there was about a two-year period where Grandpa didn't talk to his son about, about anything important. This is a real good read, but be prepared to, uh, if, you're, if you have any emotions in you, you'll probably be angry for a month or so when you read it, because um, it was our greatest, greatest battle. Frances Paul was a school teacher in Southeast. I ran into a couple of her students, which are uh, now oh, a little bit older than me. In the 1930s, her children approached her and said, can we have some stories about ourselves, her Klingit students? And so she went to her mother-in-law, Tilly Paul, and got this book. Kata'a is um, the story of, of Tilly Paul growing up in Wrangell uh, about 1860 to 1875. 
she was raised, um, she was Tia time, but she was raised uh, by her Nanya Ayi uh, Uncle Snook and high caste and learned the Klingit high caste ways in, you know, perfectly. And uh, this is her early childhood stories. Many educators are, are using this uh, in, in Southeast Alaska and other places. Um, it has recently gone out of print and uh, we're looking to reprint it again with uh, my grandmother's drawings and possibly a translation into Klingit. I have brought a few extra copies with me now. Um, I have a couple people already that I'm going to give them, give them to. Um, if you're an educator, they're they're free. I have about a dozen copies left at home. The late the later story of Tilly Paul is uh, in this form. It's called Wrangle Tilly's Town. This is, um, there's a Tilly in her old age. She just lived a very interesting life and uh, she lived in Wrangell uh, most of her life. I think she actually lived in Sitka a little while too. But in Wrangell, she, um, Wrangell had a fire in 53, I think it was, and it was too much for her to bear to see her half of her village burned. And at 90 years old, she was ready. So she died in 54. William Paul, in his travels around uh, Southeast Alaska for various reasons, getting out the Indian vote and uh, various uh, educational things. He wrote down a lot of information. Some of it is um, uh, specific to Wrangell, but this is the form that, that manuscript is in now. It's called uh, the Alaska Klingit. Where did we come from? William Paul was uh, was a highly educated man, um, having uh, educated religiously too, and uh, as a lawyer, and he loved to just write down everything that he uh, everything that he heard from a generation for him that uh, went back to uh, very early times in in Southeast Alaska. And then there's uh, my most unforgettable character again by uh, Francis Lackey Paul. This is just a short essay on Tilly Paul, her mother-in-law. If you want to turn over on the back sheet, we'll get into some, uh, and the memoirs of Francis Paul too. Um, she was a school teacher, social worker, the wife of a civil rights activist that is bound up uh, uh, loosely similar to this one. Then I brought along a, uh, a few things to show you that um, my father was a bookbinder. Uh, he was also a lawyer, a graduate of the University of Washington Law School. And he was a bookbinder. This, uh, this is actually not one of his better uh, bindings, but uh, he did some nice stuff. And he would take his legal work and gather it all together and uh, by case and and uh, bind it up this is uh, personal the personal letters for uh, this one is called uh, the Teton intervention they were trying to get a, uh, a delay of uh, of a court case the uh, famous Teton case in it it has um, things like Testimony for the plaintiff, that would be the, the Teton Indians. A cross-examination of William Paul, and he explains what he, what it was like to be a Teton. 
to be an Indian and to prove what land he owned and what kind of traditions. It, it goes on for many pages. It's quite interesting reading. And if you want to know what a what a, uh, a Klingon Indian thought about his society and and uh, economics back in 19, well, this was 1953 for this one. It makes it interesting reading. The, um, I've included uh, these bodies of works also because there, I ran across these landsuit attorney's evidence sheets. There's dozens of them. Um, they include a lot of uh, information which uh, people may be looking for, and I, I just wanted them to know that <coughs> it has been written down somewhere. This was um, an evidence sheet for somebody named uh, David Howard Sr., who lived in Sitka. Probably are people here that, that know, knew him. He was born in Sitka, he was Klingit, Raven, Kiksuddy. He gives his house, children. Sometimes they give uh, hunting grounds, the ancestral fishery. There are dozens of these sheets here and um, I just want people to know that uh, if you are looking for information like that, it it is probably here. Genevieve Howard, George Lewis Sr. The, um, one of the, uh, as I was thinking, uh, listening to our previous speaker, the uh, one of the things that uh, my father did was write a law thesis in 1939 and it was about the state of law that the Europeans had when they discovered Southeast Alaska and they had laws that they themselves that they weren't obeying very well but uh, but uh, still they could be used to constrain them and to get our get our land back. Speaking of land claims, how much time do I have? I like it to go on record that um, that William Paul uh, Senior at a at the AFN convention just before that they were going to vote whether to accept or reject the land claims act he recommended that they not accept it. He said it was way too little and 43 million acres and 938 million dollars was, wasn't even close and so reject it. It was, they were asking for 373 million acres. He knew that once the oil was got at that would be the leverage, it would be gone, and so he recommended they vote it down. Of course, it didn't happen that way. And a lot of good has come out of uh, the Land Claims Act. Um, but he, he was a fighter. He never let me win at chess. His reason for that was you, you learn more by losing. So he was always trying to teach me stuff. One of the favorite things for him to say was, uh, an education is a good thing to have. Of course, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because that's why we're here, is to get ourselves educated in our, in our own ways and uh, to figure out what, what were they thinking? What were their ancestors really thinking back then? It's important not to judge history by today's standards, by today's thoughts. The missionaries back then, and another thing I, I'd like to go on record saying is that uh, 
uh, Tilly Paul, William Paul, Francis Paul, Grandma and Grandpa, they were devout Christians. And the missionaries did some bad things, things they didn't need to do, but the missionaries did a lot of good for us too. And the great battle of our time, probably the land claims, probably would have been lost had it not been for missionaries. And yet it didn't kill our culture. That's, it, it's working out, you know, it's working out. Ellen Hayes Hope said yesterday, uh, uh, her charge was to write down those things. They may seem kind of important, you think, uh, insignificant, doesn't mean much, but write them down. And then your grandchildren can read them. One of the joys of my life is reading my father's personal correspondence. I was 21 when he died in 1974. We never talked about these things. We did a little darkroom work together and, and that was all. But reading his letters, when you, if you're doing any kind of study, reading personal letters, you can really get to know somebody because it's not like watching a, a documentary or something, it's, it's just personal stuff. Anyway, in the sharing of knowledge, uh, I'm glad that I came here to this convention. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to leave this material on this table um, the rest of the morning at least. My contact information is uh, available. And on that handout, I'm in North Seattle and, and I'd love to share even more knowledge. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a little shuffling of, of people uh, swapping out for some of these presentations. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, Gil Truitt, who's going to be doing a talk on cottages and leaders. Gil. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. For those who do not know who I am, I was born and raised in Sitka. Now, I was born in an area that I will address as a subject that I was given, which could be a very big subject, but because of the time factor, I will try to condense what I have to say because I was told if I do not finish, I will be cut off. And I've never been cut off on a speech, so I'll guarantee that that will not happen. When I was growing up here in Sitka, Sitka there were two native communities. One you're all familiar with, it's the village. The boundary was where the community house is located, down and up north to the intersection, Catlian and Albert Point Road. That was one native community. The other native community is what was called the cottages, and that was the subject that I was given. The cottages was a community by itself, and I will address this in a few minutes. But those of us who grew up in the cottages, the boundary was the extreme southern end of the Sheldon Jackson campus. And of course, Sheldon Jackson was going to have a lot to do with the establishing of those cottages. But those of us who grew up in the cottages often referred to the boys and the kids in the villages as the North Side Gang. They referred or called us the South Side Gang. The town proper was at the boundaries, Sheldon Jackson and the community building. The South Side and North Side Gang referred to those kids, which was primarily Caucasian, we referred to them as the Al Capone Gang. And that boundary was going to be extremely important when the Sitka School District started 
establishing rules, regulations, who would be eligible to attend their schools. So what they wrote and decided was only those young people living in the town proper would attend the Sitka School District. Eventually, William Paul, on a test case with Henry Singh, the older brother of Isabel Brady, took that to court and won the case, making it, making all the native young people eligible. And he did the same thing down in Ketchikan with the Jones family. But even though we were eligible to attend the Sitka School District, very few of us did. And during the time that we were not allowed to go there, there were a number of native young people attending the school district because they lived in the town proper. Some of you may know the name Bob DeArmond. He is quite a historian. He wrote about the uh, segregation in the Sitka School District. And the last thing that he wrote, the last sentence, he said, um, a check with the Native Claims Settlement Act enrollment, Shiatica Corporation, shows that the, corpor or the Sitka School District was far more integrated than people realize. And I think you understand what I'm saying, is a lot of those who passed or posed as Caucasian suddenly were signing up as natives in the enrollment. <clears throat> Sheldon Jackson had a lot to do with a lot of things besides the cottages. And of course, Sheldon Jackson and the Presbyterian Church are blamed for a lot of things that happened to our people, also to our culture. And a lot of us who have studied some of these things may sometimes disagree with what the majority agree to. Because when you're in education, you have a mission. And Sheldon Jackson had a mission. One time, a number of people my age were talking about uh, how those two institutions, Sheldon Jackson and the Presbyterian Church, are blamed for a lot of things that happened to us. And pretty soon we started laughing about some of those. Every time we mentioned something that was bad, well, we all said, well, that was the Presbyterian Church's fault, or that was Sheldon Jackson's fault. Many of you know Herb Diedrichson, and he said, what I hate most about Sheldon Jackson's school is they forced every one of us to play basketball. <laughs> I told that story to Dr. Sobloff, and Dr. Sobloff couldn't stop laughing. And he said, you know what, my friend? He said that Herbert really has a problem. <clears throat> the mission of Sheldon Jackson was to give the best possible education. And I think, for the most part, that mission was accomplished. You look around the state, many are leaders, even though they have been out of Sheldon Jackson a good number of years. Where Sheldon Jackson probably fell down was in uh, what they were emphasizing, and that's religion and biblical courses. That's just my opinion. They had strong emphasis on the academic, on vocational, and of course many made a good living by what they learned in the vocational, and the third emphasis was the biblical. They also were very strong on discipline. And I've always felt Sheldon Jackson started to go down when they relaxed on their discipline. They allowed dancing, which was not uh, allowed for many, many years. And I saw the enrollment of Sheldon Jackson go way down when they relaxed on discipline. And I have a feeling that parents no longer looked upon the school as a special school, and they were no longer sending their sons and daughters there. They also taught social values, and they were very strong on those making certain that the young people knew how to behave, knew how to dress, how to dress properly. Matter of fact, that was uh, the same with almost every boarding school in Alaska. 
but their prime goal was to prepare the young people to make a living, to find a place in the Western society. And in order to do that, they had to place an emphasis on the academics, on English. It was not so much they were saying, you cannot speak your language, but their feeling was that if you're going to learn a language, you must speak it. If you're going to learn to speak Lincoln, you must speak it. Otherwise, you'll have problems. Now, the Sitka Training School, which was the forerunner of Sheldon Jackson, after being in existence for about 10 years, if you recall your history, it was established in 1878. So by the end of the 1880s, the administration and the Presbyterian Church began to worry that we are educating these young people, but they're going back to their villages where their education may be lost. So we have to figure out a way to keep them here or to keep them in an urban area where they can make a living and where they can contribute to society. Matter of fact, I was interviewed uh, two days ago by University of Alaska Anchorage, and we talked about things like this. The one of the questions that was posed to me, do you think it's advisable for Mount Edgecombe graduates to go back to their village? And I said, only if they go back as educators. And that's what some of our graduates are doing. They're going back to their villages as teachers. And one community I mentioned to that, those two young ladies, was Shishmaref, where five of our graduates are in that school district as teachers. <clears throat> but the Presbyterian Church and Sheldon Jackson decided what they would do is create a model community. And that model community would be for Sheldon Jackson graduates or former students only. And they said, we will pattern this native community after Metlakatla. And of course, Metlakatla was just recently created by the end of the 1880s. But already, people were being impressed with what they saw in Metlakatla. And I think that's been the story throughout the history of Metlakatla. People have been very impressed with what they see. They have problems occasionally, but it's still, I think, a model community. And I'd get into another area that I don't want to address, and that's reservations. <clears throat> so in 1888, Sheldon Jackson School, or Sitka Training School, and the Presbyterian Church put this plan into effect. And only about four applicants started the cottages. Eventually, 17 homes were built. And that's what I recall, those 17 homes that lined the two streets in the cottages. And every applicant had to use the revolving loan fund that was created. Sheldon Jackson said, we will let you have this property, but it would always belong to the school. But the homes that these men built were their homes. And they're all different shapes and sizes. My grandfather built the home that we grew up in. And even though I was very young, he spoke to me often as an adult. And one of his big regrets was that he did not build a bigger home because the money was there. Today, only four of those original 17 cottages exist. And one of the things the college did, or the Sitka Training School did, was to make certain that the property that the homes were built on had enough room so the owners of those homes could plant gardens. And of course, when I was young, we had <clears throat> a garden. And most of the <clears throat> people out at the cottages planted vegetables. All the food could become scarce. We always had a lot of potatoes. Sometimes that's all we had. And you all know that you cannot put up a lot of subsistence food without refrigeration. A lot of subsistence was available, but we could not take advantage of it unless you salted the fish or salted the uh, venison or smoked it. But when you smoked it, you still couldn't uh, produce a lot without it spoiling. 
So when the cottages were created, there are several things that the people had to agree to. Uh, one was that the people out there had to respect the Sabbath and observe Sunday. And when I was very young, that still was a part of the cottage. But the cottage residents were slowly moving away from these agreements. And before long, all these agreements went by the wayside. And we witnessed some of these because of the terrible tragedies that occurred to a number of people who did not observe what they had agreed to. And the people at the cottages agreed they would take the responsibility and make certain that they provided an education for the young people. This was a big thing in the college cottages when I was growing up. Education, that was drilled into our heads. You had to get that education in order to provide a place for yourself in society. They also agreed there would be no use, no possession of alcohol. This was one of the things that led to tragedies and the pushing aside of the rules that they agreed to. Also, there would be no gambling. But I never saw any gambling out at the uh, cottages. They also agreed they had to live a healthy lifestyle. They had to know personal hygiene, how to keep a clean house, how to keep their bodies clean, and to do only what was in terms of good health. They also agreed to avoid controversial activities and customs. <clears throat> Later, that part was to close a hall that was built in the cottages. Now, the boundary I mentioned, there were two, and there are two streets still at the cottages. One is Metlakatla Street. That's the street closest to the entrance of the uh, Totem Park. And that was named Metlakatla Street to honor Peter Simpson, who I will mention in a few moments. The other street was and is Kelly Street. And I believe there were 12 homes, cottages, on Metlakatla Street and five on Kelly Street. We lived on Metlakatla Street. Our home was the last house on the right-hand side as you looked toward the mountain. And of course, all those homes were torn down because Sheldon Jackson sold that property to the Park Service in the mid-50s. And of course, I was away in school at the time, and people who lost their homes were paid and were placed in different homes here in town. And of course, I asked the question why we were not, but our home was really a shack, was being really deteriorated, deteriorating. And I was told if you had been living in it, we would have paid you for what it was worth, and it wasn't worth much. So I did not ask any more questions because I think they had a, had a good answer. But when I was growing up in the cottages, the only language we heard was English. And I think the people, the adults, probably got together and decided we will speak English only. The only time I heard uh, Slinkit was from my great-grandmother, Mrs. Don Cameron, uh, one of the Sloan sisters. She could not speak English. And of course, we could not communicate with her. But that was the only Slinkit I heard. And it didn't bother me at the time. It actually didn't bother me. I didn't think about it until years later, that when I was going to school down in the village, I had schoolmates whose second language was English. They had a difficult time. Many or maybe none of them got beyond the second grade because they couldn't handle uh, English and what was being taught in English. And I might mention too that all of them died very young, tragically in accidents because they were not in school or out, either out hunting or fishing. And the two streets where I lived, there was a shortcut, there was a path that re was really a shortcut, saved a lot of steps. 
So quite often the people living on Kelly Street would get after us and tell us not to come through this path. Stay on your own side. We were told that repeatedly, but we still took that shortcut. It was only years later that I realized that all those people living on Kelly Street were Republicans. <laughs> I think you know the story that when Republicans die, they're buried 20 feet in the ground instead of six. And the feeling is, by a lot of people, that down deep, Republicans really are not bad people. <clears throat> Some of the big leaders at the cottage was Peter Simpson. And that is the person I think I grew up respecting the most. Because he always had time to talk to young people, and I'm talking about little kids, about education, giving us advice, or sharing his philosophy. Yet he was a leader, but he took the time to talk to us. Another person I remember doing something like that was Mark Jacob Sr., who I always felt was a very kindly man towards young people. Ralph Young lived at the cottages. Frank Price, all these men were leaders. Really, they were giants. But above all of them, I always said was Peter Simpson. There was a family, the Ray James family, also was very instrumental in pushing the Alaska Native Brotherhood to what it became. And there was William Wells, a recognized Christian. We have no doubt that he's up in heaven. Same with John Willard. The cottage was a lot of things. Even when I was young, the cottage still had a big brass band. There were three brass bands, actually four here in Sitka, the Cottage Band, the A and B, the Salvation Army, and the Town Band. But when the A and B Band went on trips, the Cottage Band, Salvation Army, and A and B Band combined and made trips all over Southeast. And I think the one that they were proud of the most was when they went to Haines and went to Whitehorse, where they received standing ovations for all the music that they played. The cottage hall was built by the residents, and it was built with the idea that there was a new game just reaching the surface, and that was basketball. They decided first that the dimension would be 40 by 60. In talking to Peter Simpson later, he said they made it longer with the idea that eventually basketball would be played. And he said it was 50 by 90 feet. And the high school regulation basketball court was 84 by 50. The first basketball games were played in that hall. But that hall was used for everything. Thanksgiving holidays, Christmas holidays, there were big banquets hosted by the cottage people along with band concerts. And eventually this hall closed because some of the young men living in the cottages went south for school. When they returned, well, when they were down south, they learned how to dance. So when they returned, they started teaching the young ladies at the cottages how to dance. And of course, to dance, you have the old fashioned, you put, the man puts his hand on the lady's waist and you, away you go. Well, the staff people at Sheldon Jackson and the Presbyterians were shocked that a man would dare put his hand on the lady's waist. But that's not as bad as when the cheerleaders at Sheldon Jackson had the gall to raise their skirts that much off the floor where their ankles were shown. That was a big story in one of the old Sheldon Jackson newspapers. <clears throat> but the women had a missionary society. They met every week. That same group of women also had a basketball team and occasionally 
they played the staff women at Sheldon Jackson. But one of the great places for playing was the boat shop that was built by Peter Simpson. When you go out to Totem Park, right below that big gray house on the left side as you look toward the park, right across that house was Peter Simpson's boat shop. It was a good sized boat shop. The uh, road is quite a, quite a height, much higher than the beach. But you had to step down to get in the shop and it went out straight out and there was a big rock, big as this room. And the one end was the road, the other hit the big rocks. There was a lot of space underneath and that's where we did a lot of our playing. And Peter Simpson heard us down there so he always came down and visited. And I can never say enough about him and uh, Jerry also about Andrew Hope because when Les Yaw wrote his book, he said the same thing about Peter Simpson and Andrew Hope, that both had a long association with Sheldon Jackson in boat building, in building uh, housing, also building the sawmill, that all that was needed between Les Yaw and those two gentlemen was a handshake. That was their contract. And both Andrew Hope and Peter Simpson always did more than what they had agreed to. <clears throat> and as a young person growing up in the cottages, it was a great place to grow up. Even though we were separated by the town proper, we mingled with those in the village because we went to the same school, we had the same activities. But sometimes I'm a little disturbed when I hear young people say, there's nothing to do. We had lots to do. We had chores to do, chop wood, pack water, take care of the garden, get subsistence. But we still had time to play group games. And all those games and how we associated was under Peter Simpson's shop at Totem Park, at the beach at Totem Park. Indian River was a great place to, to grow up. And of course, the campus at Sheldon Jackson. We virtually grew up on that campus and knew just about every person who went to Sheldon Jackson. Going back, we all had heroes of those young men at Sheldon Jackson. People like the Leask brothers, Harold Downley, the Demerts, and so many others. I will close my remarks here because I don't want to get cut off because there are about two minutes left from when I started. So I appreciate your attention. And I always enjoy talking about things like the cottage, but I enjoy talking about education, I think, more. So thank you for your kind attention. Uh, my name is Donna Folk. I work at the U.S. Geological Survey. My Klingit name is Kaktagan. I'm originally from Juneau, Alaska. My grandfather was Amos Wallace. My great-grandparents were Annie and Frank James. Annie was George Dalton's sister from Huna. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about a, a kind of secret collections that not too many people know about at the U.S. Geological Survey. I mean, most people know about the Forest Service being in Southeast, but in actuality, U.S. Geological Survey was here first in all throughout Alaska and throughout the country. And uh, John Wesley Powell was the one that, uh, this gentleman right here, John Wesley Powell originally started as the second director for the U.S. Geological Survey, and he ended up becoming the founding director for the Bureau of Ethnology. And Powell was out in Indian country um, for the, with the Colorado River. And what he gave to some of, some of science is when he was doing his research on geology, um, he went down on the Colorado River and forgot to document it the first time. So the second time, he made sure he bought a cameraman. And he was the one that really started having all scientists throughout all of the disciplines start bringing cameramen with them. And the cameraman that he brought with him documented a lot of stuff and at that time they were using, um, they actually had glass negatives and the uh, 
photographs that they were doing were on glass negatives and they were actually taking thousands of pounds of, and hundreds of pounds of equipment with them because they were developing in the field. So most likely they were interested in the geology and the landscape. What's nice about all these photographs from the 1800s is that you can really get a look at Indian country, what it looked like in the late 1800s before all the roads were built. So they have documented a lot of, the, of Indian country throughout the United States and Alaska. <coughs> now, of course, John Wesley Powell was out with Indians, and um, that's how he, we ended up starting with having the Bureau of Ethnology. He, uh, when he was working out in the field with the Indians, he, uh, was, he had no arms, so the Indians kind of adopted him. He was kind of a strange figure out there, this geologist with a pick in one hand and then no arm on the other. He also started a meeting with Indians and delegations to decide what to do with the Indians. He had a passion for Indians, um, and he had a deep respect for Indians. There was a problem with when he was out there with, in the field. There was positives and negatives about his movement in the Bureau of Ethnology. And if anyone remembers the Bureau of Ethnology, they're the ones that came up with these books, these lovely, lovely green books on Tlingit culture and everything. So there's a 1906 book on Tlingit culture, and then there's the 1960s books. So the first book started at the USGS, and there were 200 bulletins from 1909 to 1960. And Powell wrote 23 of the annual reports until he died. And the Bureau of Ethnology existed until 1965. Now, Powell was, um, and he was a scientist, and when he discovered the Bureau of Ethnology, when he was creating the Bureau of Ethnology, he was trying to steer it away from anthropology anthropologist's view of just biological looks at Indians. And in the past, they had examined languages and material arts, kinship and social institutions without seeing the relationship with each other. And Powell, he believed that any single field of human activity without discovering the relationships, more of a holistic approach like Indians, that uh, if you didn't do that, then you're still merely just collecting curiosities. So Powell took an important step towards a holistic approach, because, probably because of his personal interest in language and mythology. But he was still a scientist. So he, was, he didn't see, see how Indians would see. So he was still seeing us as kind of savages. He didn't believe in the animistic qualities that Indians were giving uh, the trees and the animals. He didn't quite get that. He wasn't to that, that level because he was looking more of trying to give scientific basis and direction for the study of Indians. And why was he doing this? Because in, really, in reality, he really had a concern for Indians because he was afraid they were all going to be killed. Because in the movement west, they had stolen all the Indians' land and were moving them out of their traditional um, lands of where they knew where the fish and they knew where the deer were, they knew where the antelope were, and they were moving them out and they figured, well, let's just kill them and then we can just keep the land. Well, Powell didn't think that was right, so he started the Bureau of Ethnology to say, well, let's study them, and then it kind of got the fear factor away from looking at Indians in more of a scientific way. And so, even though he saw this scientific basis for, for studying Indians, he, um, in fact, with Powell's vision, they end up calling the Bureau of Ethnology because of him intellectual geology. So um, Powell's um, ended up helping the Indians in a lot of way, though he may have started pushing them in the reservation thing, but he knew that was the only way that they could survive is to know something about civilization and be melded into some of the white society. Um, but with there were some pluses because the books that of those green books and those collections did document a lot of stuff that Indians have had to go back to that, that are in the, particularly in the lower 48 that almost lost everything. <coughs> so um, these uh, geologists were out in Indian country with the Navajos and all over the United States and Alaska. But they also were up there at the Harriman Expedition in 1899. Now, uh, most people know about Curtis uh, William, uh, about Edward Curtis's photographs. But Edward Curtis is on that trip, but also G.K. Gilbert, who was a glaciologist, was there. And in actuality, at that time, 
Curtis's photograph is kind of sucked. I was, I'm a, I'm a, I have a background in fine art photography. I should let you know that. And Curtis was not a very good photography technically. Whereas most of these geologists were out there in the field in Alaska um, with their glass negatives because they were perfectionists, the scientists, their photographs were beautiful. So JK, um, Gilbert, of course, was looking at the landscape because he was a glaciologist. He was really studying the Earth's crust and uh, he was interested in earthquake activity, glaciers, and he ended up documenting the big San Francisco earthquake. So this is Gilbert on the right. And of course, like I said, his interest was glaci glaciers. But he did throw in some pictures of photographs of Indians too when they went up onto the North Slope. And actually when he was talking about cottages, this may be some of those cottages here in Sitka, because uh, some of the uh, captions that they had was that these were houses were almost chiefly occupied by Indians here in, in, on, during the Harriman Expedition in 1899. Uh, so he, there they are in southeast, going up uh, to Mount Edgecombe and Sitka again in the, with the giant spruces. They were also up in the North Slope area, documenting the um, Yupik peoples and Inupiaq and the Athabascans. And these uh, geologists up there, of course, were, um, there were a lot of them. Alfred Brooks, who the Brooks Range was named after, Schrader, Mendenhall, uh, Russell, Leffingwell. They were interested in also the lands, uh, landscapes and strange phenomenon. Um, this one was a later photograph. They, were, they have uh, photographs from the 60s even, but this is a uh, Pingo in the Tanana River. It's a strange phenomenon where the birch trees grow in these circles. So you, they grow, these are all white birch trees that are in the middle of all these black spruces and muskeg. And, and that's a, that's a, um, a Athabascan word too. One thing about the geologists I noticed compared to all the other disciplines, biology and all the other disciplines is that the geologists actually use um, indigenous terms as scientific terms. So in Hawaii, you had aha and pahoehoe for the lava. You have uh, nunataks, where the ice sheets flow over the mountains, and that's a Nupiak uh, word, uh, I think probably from Greenland, but uh, it means island in a sea of ice when the mountains poke through the ice sheets. Uh, more uh, photographs of some of the Athabascan people. Uh, what was funny, when you do look at some of their archival photographs, of course they're taking pictures of rocks, and when they're doing these, <laughs> these rocks, they like to show scale. Geologists are big on scale, with their little dimes next to the rock, or their pick next to the rock. So when they're out there doing, documenting other photographs, like this is one by Leffingwell, who was kind of an eccentric character on the North Slope area. Um, and he actually was probably the one that discovered oil up there in the Petroleum Reserve. Um, but um, he was documenting a whale hunt and for a good measure, he had to throw in an associate to show scale. Um, this was Leffingwell. Like I said, he was an eccentric up in the North Slope area. Um, he had lots of money. He got a boat. Someone had told him when, uh, up on the north part of Alaska in the winter time, it ice is over and you can walk up to the North Pole. Well, you know, that wasn't true. He lost all his crew. It was so cold and they lost them all in Nome. By the time he got up to the North Slope area, his boat started falling apart. He broke it down and survived the winter by breaking down his boat. And when he stayed there longer, he wrote a letter to the USGS and said, hey, I'm up here. I have a geologist background. Can I write you guys a paper? So he stayed up for 10 years and geologically mapped the whole North Slope. And the Eskimos taught him how to live off the land. And in his 1910 little journal, he writes down, how the Eskimos told him that willow was the best kind of wood to be using to make yourself a nice hut to live in the winter time and survive. And make sure you put a, blow, a hole in the top or you will suffocate. So he has this all in his 1910 journal. And of course, Brooks and, and other geologists were actually down in the southeast taking pictures of, the, of course, the, the gold rush time by that time in the late 1800s. So you see totem poles with people that are down there for that. 
but they were documenting all over in Alaska. Um, Southeast is kind of a special uh, thing for geologists because it's like a paradise dream for geologists because it's right there in the ring of fire. So, and their studies of glaciers and of course their studies of volcanoes and earthquakes is, uh, is just kind of very exciting for them. And uh, Southeast is full of earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, and what would be nice too is if uh, we harnessed like China Hot Springs, the Athabascans are doing there, is to be able to harness some of these, this thermal, geothermal energy here in Southeast so we could put less emissions in the air, not using oils, and having to be able to have free heat for our elders if we harness our own uh, hot springs and geothermal energy here. And because uh, we have the capabilities, but we're only using it for uh, recreational purposes for tourists. Um, this is Latoya Bay. And I'm involved in a lot of native science discussions about how Indian folklore is actually a kind of native science approach to earth phenomena and stuff. And this is Latoya Bay. And you'll see the white lines here. This is when the, the uh, big tsunami hit in 1958. And in Indian culture, in Klinka culture, they know Latoya Bay. And this is a pipe depicting Latoya Bay. And uh, the story goes is that the that the, there were creatures in uh, Toy Bay that did not like strangers. So they would rock the boat and they would knock the boat over and turn the people into tame bears. So you'll see the, there's, a, there's these waves on the top of the pipe and there's a little uh, brass inlay of a boat with people in it. Um, this was a per and so Indians have known about this bay for a very long time and have documented it through their folklore. And the Toya Bay's uh, tsunami, mega tsunami, it was an earthquake that knocked about, you know, tons of rocks right into the bay and caused this surge of about 1,700 feet surge, and I guess it killed a lot of people. I mean, it killed only a couple of people, and one boat, one fishing boat rode the wave and ended up in the trees. But it was such a powerful uh, wave that, um, that's why you saw that white on the previous slide, is that these were actually trees that had knocked the bark off all the trees on the bottom. And that's what the white is. It was that powerful. And like I said, in f folklore and the, the Thunderbird, these are all about Earth phenomena. These are our own native scientists' approach to looking at um, uh, Earth phenomena in a, in a different way. Of course, uh, we also use geology, uh, copper, um, for creating some of our most beautiful objects, copper shields. Uh, we also used jade. Jade was the original um, points for the tools and, and the ads is for carving totem poles before the trade of, s of st steel. Um, geology, USGS does still do mapping, and everybody knows the topo maps. But they're actually going a little farther away, and I really like looking at the new land sets with the, with the partnership they have with NASA, because they own a, a satellite, USGS does. And so they take these photographs, and this is Alaska in the winter, North Slope area. And of course in the summertime. Now they've started this new movement and PAL has to be credited too for helping to, when they started documenting and doing maps in the old days, people were naming towns and mountains after each other, little jokes among the geologists. And later he said, you know, you need to go out and find out through the Indians what the local people are calling it. And that's when they started the movement for naming things as uh, indigenous names. And today, they're going back even today, just recently in 2000, um, in um, Alaska, mapping some of the things. And the, the rule was you couldn't have hyphenations. So when it said White's Mountain, it, there was no hyphenation. It was just Whites. And you couldn't have accent marks or any kind of symbolism in there until 2000. They just started doing this. And when they start going back to get indigenous names for a lot of places, and they're now allowing the X with the underline, the ah sound. So brand new. <laughs> so uh, they're going around and they're documenting these sounds and adding them to the new maps. Um, they do, uh, looking at too, some of the older photographs of the glaciers that USGS does comparatively to some of the newer 
the technology they have on looking at glaciers, they can really see the climate change. You can see how far back the glaciers are receding. By looking at some of those old USGS photographs of uh, the glaciers in 1910 and 1899, and, this, and, and looking at them comparatively to today, and you can see how far back it's gone, and you can really see the climate change here in Alaska, and Alaska really demonstrates all of this. The USGS collections is about, um, has, they have 10% online, and this is their website. Um, it, they have, it's, it's kind of amazing, they have medium resolution, small, small resolution, so you can go back and forth on that. Uh, they have three, th like I said, it's only 10% of their collections of skin in this right now, but that's approximately 30,000 photographs. Um, like I said, I work for the Geological Survey and do some outreach stuff, so I do a lot of educational things. Showing and show science, it's fun as kids. I'm an illustrator. So these are some of my cartoon characters for science, for geology, uh, chemistry, uh, hydrology, mapping, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes, uh, earthquakes and biology. I'm also involved in native science. I do a lot of native science discussions to kids in schools and things like that. And we recently did an exhibit to show how indigenous uh, knowledge with science uh, together. So that we did this mysteries in science to show Indians stories and lore. And we used a lot of those posters like what you had saw earlier with the Thunderbird on the case of the traveling tsunami because uh, the uh, uh, Washington State tribes there, they have uh, these uh, ghost forests and they can look at the tree rings and you can tell how when these uh, earthquakes uh, happen and when the tsunamis hit the west coast and the Japanese from the 17, 1700s on their silk screens, they can actually compare it with, with the Indian stuff that's happening in, on the uh, Washington state, which is kind of amazing. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear this, but um, this is uh, Dan Wildcat, and we're trying to get some of these. Uh, He's been working on some indigenous projects with a couple of other native scientists that I work with at the U.S. Geological Survey, and we're maybe be doing a partnership with the Indian Museum on Geology. But he did one uh, called Mother Earth, and and we're hopefully we'll get some clips here online in the next year. Mother Earth. The images we get from space are of a planet that is settled and calm, and yet we know that is not the case. She is in a process of constant geologic activity, geologic activities that shape the body of this planet Earth. Geology is really the study of the structure, the origin, the functions and processes of this planet Earth. Geologists like to ask questions. They ask questions such as, what is the origin of the planet? What are the materials she's made of? What is her structure? Why does she do the things she does? And even, what does the future hold for this planet, Mother Earth? Think of what geologists do as learning a language, learning to hear a story that this planet can tell us, a story with the major characters of the Earth itself, air, water, and fire. From an indigenous perspective, earth science is really learning the language and the story that our mother can tell us. And in this story, we will become more aware of who we are and our place in this incredible earth history. So that's, that's just a piece of it, but it's a much longer video. So if any of you are interested, I, I think we have a few videos that we could probably send to you. Ah, uh, and goodness, cheese. <laughs>